So almost to our last most difficult one, the solvent is something that you would typically skip over uh, because you don't get a whole lot of use out of the solvent, okay? And it can also be very, very tricky to work with, okay? So they tend to play a hidden role. The primary reason we use solvents is to get all of our reagents into the same phase. Once they're all in the same phase, they can all react, and everything is great and happy and fantastic, okay? As a secondary role, okay, which this is the hidden one, they can be used to either stabilize or destabilize certain reagents or intermediates in the course of our reaction. So we have to be careful by understanding our mechanism to say, what is this solvent going to do to it? Is this going to mess up my reaction? Okay, so first and foremost, what are our general classifications? Okay, hopefully you would nail down we've got polar and nonpolar solvent classifications. On top of that, Hopefully you remember that we have protic and aprotic. Okay, so let's pick some examples here. Okay, if we go back to polar and nonpolar, well, nonpolar means we're looking at nonpolar covalent bonds, so things with say carbon and hydrogen. Okay, our polar uh, solvents would be things with say oxygen, nitrogen. You can even throw sulfur in there, uh, a little bit less sulfur, fluorine. Okay, those tend to be our classic polar solvents. Why? Because those are our electronegative elements, and those electronegative elements get us polar covalent bonds, which is why we would call them polar solvents, because of the polar bond. Okay? When we shift up to protic versus aprotic, well, protic is really just a fancy way of saying it is a hydrogen bonding solvent. Okay? And we're saying hydrogen bonding, in this case it goes back to the classic definition, Okay, it must be a hydrogen bond donor. Okay, it has to have that ability to be a protic solvent. Okay, so our classic protic solvent, water, fantastic protic solvent. Okay, water ends up not being a very good solvent for organic chemistry because most of our organic mar our molecules have a bunch of nonpolar sections. So we can modify the structure by, say, putting on a carbon chain. And we now have a protic solvent that can dissolve our nonpolar organic materials. We have ethanol. Great. Okay. What happens if we move to an aprotic solvent? Well, we still need to be polar, so we still need, say, an electronegative element like oxygen. But it can't be attached to a hydrogen, because if it's a hydrogen, it's now protic. Okay. So we can go through as a good example and pick, say, acetone. Acetone is a great aprotic solvent because we have this electronegative oxygen attached to a less electronegative carbon, and we now got still that polar aspect, okay, but it doesn't have that hydrogen bonding ability okay, or that hydrogen bond don donor ability. In a nonpolar solvent, we need to make sure we have no oxygens or nitrogens. The easiest solvent we could go through and do there would be something like one, two, three, four, five, six hexanes, okay. Uh, toluene, okay, a benzene ring with a methyl group. So those are our good kind of nonpolar solvents. Okay, well, what are each of these things doing? So remember, we've classified them according to how they can potentially react and what they can dissolve. But it's going to come down to what they are doing when they dissolve. If we look at a protic solvent, it works great at dissolving polar species because the oxygen has a large partial negative, being the most electronegative atom, and our hydrogen has a large partial positive. So it is the largest polar molecule I can generate because of that hydrogen bonding interaction. So really big partial positives and negatives. That partial positive can potentially stabilize a partial negative somewhere else. Okay? So if I have a partial negative, the positive stabilizes it, and great, that species is now more stable. But what if I want it to be negative so that it reacts? Well, then crap, the protic solvent just stabilized my negative, and now it doesn't work anymore. Okay? Conversely, the same idea with our partial negative. That partial negative can stabilize a positive. So cool, if I want to stabilize a positive intermediate, a protic solvent is a great option. I get the biggest negative bang for my buck to stabilize that positive charge and drop its energy. Okay? But what if I don't want it to be stable. What if I want it to be reactive? Well, if I want it to be reactive, then what happens? I 
just now stabilized it and I'm not going to get the reaction to go. So we need to be careful in our selection of our solvent to mimic and kind of push certain features uh, that we want to have happen. Okay? So that's what we've got to be thinking about when we look at our solvents. Some big classifications, so here we've got some general ones here. Uh, I'm going to actually recommend that you take a moment to pause the video because what I want to go through and do here is actually classify these. So pause, please, and hopefully you're now back after having paused and you've classified these already. Okay, so let's go through and look at these. Carbons and hydrogens, only in that first one, we're looking at a nonpolar solvent. DMSO, we've got oxygen, so we're looking at a polar solvent minimally, okay? but you'll notice there's no hydrogens attached to an electronegative element, so we're looking at an aprotic polar solvent. When we move to methanol, I see my electronegative oxygen again, so I'm looking at a polar solvent, okay? but I also have a hydrogen attached to that oxygen, which means I'm looking at a protic polar solvent. DCM gets a little bit tricky here because I have chlorines and chlorines are electronegative. Okay? They aren't as electronegative as oxygen, so where do they fall? Well, they're going to be kind of more on the polar end, but kind of nonpolar as well. So we're looking at an intermediate polarity here between polar and nonpolar because our chlorine isn't quite as electronegative. This one will absolutely still be a protic because I don't have a hydrogen connected to any one of them. We move to our acetic acid, electronegative oxygen, straight up polar, okay? and we have a hydrogen connected to that oxygen, so we have a protic polar solvent. Okay? So now the question is, how do we use all this? Okay? Well, the first thing I want you to evaluate is that when you think solvents and you're trying to decide what type of reaction to go through and do, really what you need to do for your focus is to keep your solvent rankings to your substitution reactions. Okay? This doesn't mean if you see a solvent you're only doing substitution. Okay? What this means is that the solvent can be very misleading in the elimination reaction. Okay? Because, yeah, for other reasons. So when you're looking at solvents and trying to decide reactions, you're really only going to allow you to decide between SN1 versus SN2. Do not use it to define between your elimination mechanisms because it's not going to work. You have to keep it on your substitutions. Okay? So let's go and look at our SN1 mechanism. Well, in our SN1 reaction, what were we concerned about? Okay? We're concerned about the formation of our carbocation. Okay, which then meant that our rate for our SN1 mechanism was dependent solely on the concentration of our substrate. Okay, and we don't care about anything else. Okay, so how is the solvent really going to help us out? Okay, well, what does the solvent do to a carbocation? Okay, it has the potential to stabilize or destabilize it. Well, in an SN1 reaction, I want to go to my carbocation. That first step is the hardest step to go through and achieve. Okay? What happens if I make that carbocation more stable? Okay? Well, now my reaction should speed up. What if I make that carbocation less stable? Okay? Well, now that reaction slows down. Okay? So if we look at our situation, we want to make the carbocation as stable as possible. Well, how do I stabilize a carbocation? What do I need? Well, I need electrons. Okay. Where can I get electrons in a temporary stabilization system? Okay. Well, I want the largest partial negative that I can possibly get. Which solvent gives me the largest partial negative? The largest partial negative is going to come from our polar protic solvent. Okay, hydrogen being the least electronegative element we've got, okay, at least for the most part, okay, uh, is going to give our oxygen the largest negative charge, or our nitrogen the largest negative charge uh, 
that stabilizes the carbocation. Okay? That then is going to drop the energy of our carbocation and speed our reaction up. So when we're looking at SN1, I want a polar protic solvent. Okay? What happens if we shift to SN2? Okay, well, in SN2, the key word that we need to remember here is backside attack. Okay, so we're primarily concerned about sterics because everything is happening at the same time. And if we went to look at our rate, our rate would be equal to our rate constant times whatever our substrate is times the concentration of our nucleophile. Okay, so the nucleophile is important in our reaction. And if we use the same logic as we use for the SN1, we might think about, well, how can we stabilize an intermediate? Well, there is no intermediate. Well, crap. Okay, so I can't look at the intermediate. Okay. Well, let's look at the most reactive thing, then, between our substrate and our nucleophile. Okay, well, the nucleophile is typically negatively charged because I need a strong one. The stronger the nucleophile is, the faster that reaction goes. Okay, so I want a really big negative on my nucleophile, and my substrate is going to be neutral, so the negative is the most reactive thing. So to get my reaction to work, I want that negative as negative as possible, so nothing should stabilize it. If anything stabilizes it, it becomes less negative. That's horrible. Okay. So what solvent should I use? Well, if I use a polar protic solvent, what did the protic solvent contribute? Well, the protic solvent did contribute that partial negative, but at the same time, it also contributes a large partial positive, okay, being the hydrogen that partial positive will neutralize the nucleophile, which then kills my nucleophile. Ooh, so crap, polar protic, horrible, horrible. I don't want to use polar protic, that's a bad idea. Okay, so the polar protic is awful, awful, awful for the SN2 mechanism. Okay, well, let's go the complete polar opposite of that. Let's go to a nonpolar solvent. What happens if we're nonpolar? Well, now it doesn't react with the nucleophile at all. Great, so the nucleophile is super negative, okay? But now what's the issue? The nucleophile never interacts with the solvent, which means it doesn't dissolve. It stays all by itself. Well, where does our substrate interact? Well, our substrate, being relatively nonpolar as well, goes into the solvent. That means we have a biphasic system, okay, or a heterogeneous reaction. We don't want a heterogeneous reaction. The whole point of our solvent was to get them all into the same phase. So while the nonpolar may actually activate and keep our nucleophile super, super good for us, the issue with it is it minimizes the reactivity between them. Well, shoot, if I can't use a nonpolar solvent, I can't use a polar protic solvent, what am I left with? Okay, I'm left with an aprotic polar solvent. Okay or if I maintain the, the word choice I've been using, I need a polar aprotic solvent. Okay, and you may be thinking, but Mike, doesn't the polarity cancel the negative charge? You're right, it does. Okay? And it is a necessary evil in the course of the SN2 reaction because we need something to, to at least get the nucleophile to mix and interact with the substrate. Okay. So really the only choice that we can use for the, apro for the SN2 is the polar aprotic solvent. Okay. How does this then help us out in distinguishing between the SN1 and the SN2? Well, there it is. One case, I need a protic solvent. In the other case, I need an aprotic solvent. SN1, protic. SN2, aprotic. And I've got a way to differentiate the two mechanisms. Pretty handy. Okay. So, when you're looking at your solvent, think about that stabilization or destabilization of your reagents or intermediates. Okay? Which type of compound or which type of solvent is going to be best for salt compounds? What's going to stabilize a leaving group? What is bad for nucleophiles? Okay? So, it's kind of a, a careful dance on deciding how we can go through and get all of those things to come together at once. And sometimes, in the case of the SN2, we're just kind of SOL. We've got to deal with what we got. Okay? Other times, like the SN1, we have a perfect target to stabilize our carbocation. Everything's great. Okay? When we talked about the SN1, we didn't talk about the nucleophile. That's an interesting question. Why did I not talk about the nucleophile? Maybe you should ask yourself that, and hopefully you can nail that down on your own.